OK, so everyone online can see and hear me and everyone here can definitely see me and and hear me. Uh, thanks very much for coming. I'll do uh, an overview of my recently our recently released book for everyone who hasn't seen it. This is the copy stolen from the lab, so I'll bring it back later and everyone can play with it. Uh, the way I'm going to cover this talk is I'm going to have. Oh, that's a transcription, sorry. I'm going to have um, a set of slides to sort of give you the context of where the book came from and, and what we try to do with it. And then if the gods of the live demos uh, work, I will try to do a live demo with the book, which bear with me. So if you want to follow this talk, uh, the slides are online. You can scan, scan the QR code or um, follow that address. The point is we actually now have a book, an actual uh, paper copy, sellable, tradable, buyable book that you can all order uh, at the link on the QR code. If you want to, you click on that if you're seeing this online. Um, I, me and all my family will be eternally grateful for your contributions. Uh, but the point of, and one of the key points of this book was that if you don't want to, you hate me that much and you don't want to order the book and you don't want to uh, pay for it, you don't have to. You can also access it free forever on the web. Uh, the book is an online resource that you can access on geographic data science. Sorry, geographicdata.science forward slash book uh, that you can launch on uh, ephemeral cloud instance on Finder if you want to play with it on this pod. And if you're so inclined that you can clone on GitHub and do what you will with it. So the book is a collaboration, a uh, couple of long term friends, really. Uh, it doesn't say this lightly, it's one of the Owners of the project was being able to write it with Serge, Serge Ray, who's now at San Diego State, and Levi Wolf, who's at Bristol. Um, and a bit of what we're gonna, what I'm going to do today, I'll tell you a couple of slides. Vision is a big word, maybe it's not that big. What I'll say, but a little bit of the background method and sort of uh, philosophy or or why. The motivation for why we wrote a book like this. Writing a book, as I found out, is a ton of time. Uh, so next book I'll write, I'll probably try to spend a bit more time on deciding first whether I want to write it, and then if I actually commit to them, uh, fine. But this one was a bit uh, the other way around. We we jumped on the project, and then later we realized that actually it was a lot more time than we thought. But anyway, I'll give you a bit of the background. Um, I'll show you very, very quickly an overview of what the book contains and what it tries to, what's the gap that it tries to fill, uh, and then how how we build this book. And the book is already out, but a little bit about how the, the process went, and, and we envision it to continue going actually. So the motivation, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm going to skip very quickly these slides because the, um, yeah, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, it's fair to say. Uh, there's a lot of data that's becoming available. A lot of it is tabular, a lot of it is not. Uh, most of it is actually georeference, which is to say that you can put it somewhere on the on the map. Um, for most of the data that is not georeference, what the world invented was called data science. This happened in in the you know late 2000s, early 2010s, and um, and that's sort of you know the rest is history, as they say. Uh, for the 80% that is seemingly georeferenced, uh, there isn't actually much that that tells you how to make the most of it. And there's of course a lot. I mean, data science, traditional data science, if there is such thing, has dealt with a lot of spatial data. But step number one in dealing with spatial data is ignoring that it's spatial, then assuming it's data and, and carrying on. So uh, this is sort of part of the memorability of the lab already. Uh, we think not only me and my co-authors, but hopefully everyone here at Liverpool, that that actually data science is really geographic data science, and you should recognize it, and you should um, make the most of the spatial dimension of, of, of your data. So if you want to know more about all of these sort of vision and, and motivation, uh, Alex and I wrote a book, sorry, we were 
with with not write a book or generally. Uh, no, I, I don't think I will write a book either anytime soon again. But we did write a paper a few years ago. It does say 21, although the paper was. We started writing in 2015, certainly, and, and then, you know, the fun and joys of the editorial process uh, took us there. But there's a bit, a lot of what we're trying to do with the book is actually an implementation and sort of expanding on the methods and the, the skills that we think you need for fulfilling this, this sort of geographic data vision. So what is the book? What's part of the of the book? Uh, this is actually a slide or a, a figure that we had to create when we were convincing the, which is another funny thing that you learn when you write a book, you have to convince the publisher to uh, to do work for free and let them take your profits if there are any. Uh, but we did write a proposal and in the proposal, and this is when I was putting the slides, I revisited this file from 2018 or something, and there's a lot more that has sort of grown on on the different bits, but I think the, the fundamentals are pretty much there. What we're trying to do is modern data science with a lot of the good stuff that has been building in GIS and GI science for a while, for much longer than data science has been around arguably, um, and demonstrated and illustrated, and that's an important point that it's it's a demonstration in, in Python. And our pitch to the publisher was really, of any of these three, you can pick any two and you will already find books probably more than you want uh, in the market already out there. Uh, however, there is sort of this secret sweet spot in the middle of the three that we don't think there is there is much. And I actually don't think there's still much today. Well, there's our book, but I don't think there's a lot more um, hitting the three of them. And some of them, there's GIS and Python, there's a book on GIS algorithms that that's really good, but it's really just GIS algorithms. Uh, Python and data science, there's a whole industry that's basically the de facto lingua for data science. And then GIS and data science, there's a little bit, and there's there's probably more now than when we pitched the book. Um, it tends to be in R, and there's arguments, hopefully, I'll convince you later for why it's also good that there is something in Python. So a couple of things we very quickly, when we started, not pitching the book, but telling people around uh, about what we were trying to do with the book. We found that it was a lot easier to define what the book isn't rather than what the book actually is or it tries to be. Uh, so I'll start with that. Uh, it's not a GIS started. There's again a whole host of really good books and literature that will tell you what GI science is, what GIS is and why is relevant and how to do it. Uh, so we don't want to reinvent that wheel. It's also definitely not an introduction to programming. Again, this is not a, an industry we claim to have any uh, uniqueness or comparative advantage on. So if you really want to start program, there's plenty of books for that. And you, know, you can start programming with this, but this is not per se an introduction to, to programming. And finally, one that sort of got at it perhaps a bit later, again, one of the problems of being the a newbie writing books and search has written a bunch of them, but he sort of kept it quiet. We started thinking it was going to allow us to do to get into a lot of depth into most of what we wanted to cover because we didn't think it was going to be that much. And very, very quickly it became obvious that if we wanted to do an in-depth volume, we should do it of one of the chapters of the of what ended up in the book and just do it about that. And you could, and in some cases there are. Um, but after discussing it, we realized that what we what we really were trying to do with this book, the ethos of the book is introducing the field, if you wish, of geographic data science, and that it should be really an in-breath look and at the at the field. So trying to you know cast a really wide net, cover a lot of topics. And if you want more detail, we provide references for what you should follow later, but that, that shouldn't be us. And then the other thing that trying to pitch it to a publisher does sometimes is some of them will ask you, well, who is this book for? What are the personas that that should buy it if you, if you are successful at it? And I first thought it was a little bit of marketing bullshit that make you do this, but going through the exercise was actually very, very useful to think what is the tone that you should pitch the book at? What is the kind of person that, that you really want to benefit from and that you would ideally want to shell out whatever the publisher charges for this book uh, once it's out. So we ended up coming up with these three personas. Uh, I should come up, I should, maybe we should do some drawings or something. <laughs> you know, Joey and Lisa 
we are a GIS scientist, and but we don't have that. Uh, what we do have is at least the, the names. This is for data scientists or people who don't necessarily have a lot of background in geo, but are constantly working in uh, with data. They're probably at a company um, trying to make the most of their data to make the company more successful, and you know perhaps surprisingly or not surprisingly, eighty percent of you know whatever percentage, but a lot of the data that you that are out there are spatial. They may realize that actually they may want to treat it as as such rather than just ignoring the location. So, and this is probably this was very very clear at least in my mind when we were writing the book. We try to pitch it as a data science artifact. It's something that talks about features, that talks about training, that talks about cross validation. That's fairly confident or assumes a little bit of confidence on that. And then it reframes a lot of the traditional GI science in that in that uh, context. So that's one. But at the same time, it's a little bit by the same token, you can invert it and say, well, if you really know everything about or a lot about traditional GI science and geo, you can use this as a gentle introduction for how the things that you you've always known, how they can be treated now in a much more contemporary context. Why, you know, if you come from GI science, you're right hand variables may be right hand side variables or exo exogenous variables if you're an economist you may then learn that it's features and you may learn that also with a traditional data science but hopefully we we do that in the context of of geographic data and then finally this came up really a bit more organically from our own background and we didn't necessarily intend it that way but if you look at all the examples if you look at our background and you look at where most of the tools that we cover in the book are used in, in academia. It really is in quantitative social science. So we then also realize that the book is a good tool, hopefully, for social scientists who are familiar with social science problems in an urban or geospatial just, just domain. We would require. I'm going to skip that. Uh, um, OK, what if? No, actually. Yeah. I don't need to. Okay. Um, so, if you're a quantitative social scientist who want a gentle introduction to working with just spatial data in a programming environment, this is, we think, or we hope, is a good, a good um, investment of your time. So, what's the content? I'm not going to uh, go in detail into all of them, but the book has. Broadly speaking, three main parts. One is what we call the building blocks, then the other one, which is the core spatial data analysis. And then we have four chapters on, on what we call advanced topics, which of course each part built on the previous one. And you couldn't just jump into the advanced topics if you haven't covered the, the previous one. So the building blocks, there's a little bit of uh motivation and a little bit of what I've been talking about now in chapter one and why. By writing this book and why, which is really to say, why is geographic thinking useful for data scientists? And uh, like almost everything, the first chapter was the last one we wrote. And by then, we had a better sense of what the book was trying to do. And I think is well, I'm biased perhaps, but I think it's one of the best ones in the in the in the whole book because it was sort of a wrap up of everything that we had been thinking about for. Over five years, it was going to be a three year enterprise and then three became five. Um, so there's a little bit of the geographic thinking. Then when we started, we wanted, we always knew we wanted to write it as an open artifact. What we didn't quite realize is how tricky that was going to be. So as part of that, we, it became clear that if it was tricky for the person who's writing the book, it was probably going to be tricky to understand the context for the people who were, who were hopefully consuming it. So that ended up also becoming chapter two, which is an overview that doesn't really have a lot of geo in there, but there's an overview of open science, reproducibility, and then more pragmatically how we made the book um, reproducible and transferable. And then there's a general introduction to spatial data, different types. Uh, and this one, I think that the spatial data, I think is the one where it's clearest that we're, we're doing is not reinventing the wheel, is, is renaming the wheel to a, a to appeal or at least to connect to a different community, which is that of, of data science. So if you if you read it as a GI scientist, it, it'll probably piss you off a little bit because you'll say this we've known for a long time and actually we don't call it like that. And that's 
to some extent true. Uh, our response to that is that maybe that's why people have engaged with this and we haven't done a lot of the exercise of translating into the language that other people use. And then spatial weights matrices or, or geographs is something that's so fundamental to pretty much everything we do in all the other chapters that we thought we had to cover it first to then sort of assume that you know what it is and jump right into the, the different bits. Then spatial data analysis, a lot of uh, univariate uh, statistics or univariate spatial statistics, this choropleth mapping, thematic mapping, uh, space a lot of correlation at a very conceptual level, and then global and local, and a tiny bit on point patterns, uh, because it's just such a unique type of data compared to all the other ones. And on advanced topics, the first one is access space inequality, and I can't remember if search just said I want to do a chapter on space inequality, or one of the reviewers possibly might have said with the lineup that you have in the author list, uh, you're missing the trick not putting in a chapter on space inequality. But either way, uh, space inequality is something that search one of the co-authors has spent her his entire career really uh, developing the methods and then contributing to to push the envelope. So there's a really nice overview that summarizes how you go from very simple, traditional, and not necessarily explicitly spatial approaches to much more uh, explicitly spatial techniques and more, more recent. There's one on clustering and regionalization, and that one in some ways came out. Well, a lot of these, weirdly, the outline came from the GDS course that I started teaching here when I came at Liverpool. Um, and around that time, I had come up with all these materials and Serge had a ton of materials from teaching and Levi too. And we said, we should maybe put them together. <laughs> and how, how long can that take? It may be a year max. And that's, that's where the failure was. But uh, I had a, a, and actually still do, a week on clustering and geodemographics. And a lot of that sort of ended up making its way into this chapter. Spatial regression is also something that's probably one of the things not that we're very well known, but if we are it's one of the one of the tags that people probably attach to to the three of us. And what we do here, rather than again, rather than going into in depth into the more traditional spatial econometrics or the more advanced you know, basin spatial modeling, we try to give really an overview of how you would go about embedding space in regression analysis. And and this is much more conceptual than it seems. It's, it's really about what aspects of space do you think are relevant for your processes and how can you, what are the tools that the lit different literature have provided to uh, to embed it? The techniques are, are actually really, really simple, I think. And in this chapter, we don't go into much complexity, but hopefully they're, they're advanced enough that make the point of how it is that you're embedding space and how it is different from the other ways of approaching these. And it's spatial regression. What we do there is really how you embed space in the way that you model your data, uh, which is to say, what are the techniques that you use? The, the final one, which is another one, is one of I'm most proud of, and I mean, I'm proud of all, like all your ch children. The, you're proud of all of them, but maybe you like some a little bit more than others, or maybe children is not the good example, but your, your record labels, let's put it, uh, your records if you're a musician. Uh, this is another one that it's a bit tricky. If you hand it to a GA scientist, it's probably going to say there's nothing new here. And what's the point of changing the names completely in what we've done for 30 years, which to a certain extent is actually true. Um, but then again, our answer is well, because we think there's a whole lot of people that should be using all of these, and they are, and they actually don't even know they exist. So a lot of what we do in this chapter that we call spatial feature engineering is translating many of traditional GA science techniques and, and what GA scientists would call analysis um, into a more data science framework. So the way we explain it is spatial recursion chapter is about embedding space in your modeling. Spatial feature engineering is embedding space on your features, on your variables, on your data, and how you can exploit space to make the most and make more uh, get more out of your data than you would if you weren't using space. So in some ways, it's the last one, but it really pits in the in the very beginning that um, the value of it. And then a final quick note on how we went about doing the book. It's one of the things that at least 
I am and I think Levi and Serge are the same are most proud of, but it's all, or perhaps because it was one of the biggest headaches of writing a book. So the book's written in Python. That, that part was easy. I think if we were all honest, there would never ever any other option for the three of us at least. Um, but again, if you go back to the Venn diagram before, we felt that there really wasn't very much that had enough analysis, enough traditional robust GI science, and enough data science that would combine that was actually in Python. Um, this GI, well, I've, I've given you that slide before. And now, why why would you want to have that? Well, because ninety percent of the data science industry, which is a pretty growing industry, is actually written in Python and runs in Python. So, if you want to be relevant in that community and you want to have a voice in that debate, you probably have to speak it in Python. So uh, the other reason is that's really what we like to write, the three of us, so, but that didn't sell, probably didn't convince many publishers. Uh, the book is radically open. So there's a website where we documented what we did with the books. And as we were writing it, uh, you could see some updates on when we had sub submitted milestones and so on. That's fine. Um, the actual book was also open, uh, which it's a common but less common than, than just telling people that you write in a book. Uh, you actually write the book in the open. It was open also from day one, which is to say, if you were so inclined, you would have been able to follow the, the history of what we write on the Git commit logs. And well, you can still do that if you're so inclined, um, which is to say all the mistakes we made, all the uh things we got right they're all there for for posterity and and they were in the open from the very beginning and again that is a little less common than the traditional i write the book in the comfort of my cupboard and once it's done and i'm happy with it then i'll put it out for everyone to to see we thought that it was in some ways important to do this open from from day one um and we thought it was important from day one because that meant that, like with any other open source project, we could start require, uh, requesting uh, feedback and we could get uh, early impressions on, on the book beyond what you would just do through, through a publisher, which they do a little bit of that. And then it's also radically open in the sense that it treats code as text. We use a lot of code in the book, not for the sake of using code, but because we think is the, the main intellectual or pedagogical vehicle to communicate some of the concepts that we're trying to, to teach. And you could write two paragraphs trying to explain what you do, or you could write three lines of code showing how you do it. And, and we try to take the, the latter one in most cases. So there's a lot of text, and this is actually, the, I think I stole that from a paper that Serge wrote in 2009 or something like that. Um, show me the code if you're, if you're looking it up. Where he argues that code should be really a first class citizen. When you're teaching computational concepts, you should teach them in the lingua franca, which is computer code. And we do a lot of that. Um, what we also do is we try we treat text as, as code. The book itself is you can think of it as a software artifact. It's all on GitHub, of course, but it's also treated as an open source project in that every time we make a change, there's a suite of robots that set up an environment and test that the whole book runs and that it spits out what it's supposed to spit out and that it doesn't uh, crash or and and this is in if you're familiar with software development this is continuous integration this is the bread and butter of how you write software today uh, it's definitely not the bread and butter how you write books but we thought it was important to make a point of using a similar approach because a lot of what we do is really in computer code or the value of the book is in computer code and then of course it's it's python it's open source uh, it runs anywhere and we've we spent a lot of time uh, trying to make the trying to lower the barrier for everyone to to jump on the book and and be able to to run it. Um, and there's a technical element to that, which is writing transferable platforms, Docker images, and so on. But there's also a more social uh, aspect to it, which is getting everyone on board and developing the not only technical but guidance. Um, that people need to to sort of get up to speed. So this is a project that Francisco and I did about a couple of years ago when when we realized we had to teach people to install R and we couldn't be right next to them physically, um, which it was already a very challenging task to, to be fair, even when you're in person, but it was even more uh, when we weren't. 
So the book also runs on, on that platform and it sort of piggybacks on a lot of that work than in some way we've done at the lab for, for a while. You can try it out. Uh, I did try it this morning and it worked. I did take a little bit, but it might be faster a bit now. Every page on the book, if you go, I'll show you in a second, has a tab with a rocket and a label for binder. If you click on binder, that will spin up an ephemeral cloud instance that will allow you to run the whole chapter that you that you want and actually the whole book uh, on a browser without installing anything. If you want to play with it, it's there. And if you uh, think it sucks, I would love you. We would love for you to tell us uh, and to tell us in a constructive way, which is to say, we would love you. We would love it if you could open a new issue on the GitHub repository and tell us um, everything that you think should be changed. And we may choose to ignore it, but so far that hasn't happened. Everything that we've been told was very fair and, and has been included. And I was actually going to. Maybe for version two, that might also mean eventually. Let's bring up the page here. At the time we actually had to write the paper copy, we knew who had uh, contributed. And there's an acknowledgement section which has our parents and all of that, of course, but it also has everyone who opened an issue or contributed a PR or just highlighted something that they thought would make the book a bit better. Uh, and there, there's a couple from the lab. And there's a whole bunch of people I've never heard of before, so it's pretty um, enlightening. Okay, so that takes me uh, to the, the real wild part of the of the talk. Uh, so that's a bit of the context, and then I wanted to show you, I wanted to lead by example and sort of uh, walk the talk and talk to walk or whatever it is you say, and you know after spending thirty minutes telling you that you can run this anywhere and that you can do uh, all these amazing things with it. Uh, I thought it would look a li little awkward if I actually didn't show you. So, so this is the book. You can access it, geographicdata.science forward slash book. Again, this is free and will always be free. Uh, as I said, you can go and there is the rocket right there. You can click on, on binder and it will spin up the, the instance. Uh, you can click on call up and I'm before, I'm not sure what will happen for that when you click call up. We haven't engaged very much with that platform just yet because it's a little tricky to um, to tweak it so that it's ready with all the libraries that you, that you want. But it's there. Uh, and as I said, everything, the website, the blog, and the book, so that notebooks folder contains all the all the magic. It's on GitHub, so you can you can clone it and do whatever you want with it. And if you have a Jupyter Lab instance, uh, you can also run. So remember, I just showed you here the book repo. So if you have a little bit of memory, there's a data, docs, figures, infrastructure, and notebooks. Uh, if you open a um, Jupyter Lab instance on the book you will see that there's the same folders and the same items and this is how you can run it so i think i don't know if i'm correct this morning and the last time i checked the uh the poll that i said for which chapter to use wasn't the regression one so i'm going to use that one uh, but anyone will do because i'm not going to go in detail by through all of them uh you can double click on the regression IPYMB file, IPYMB for uh, Jupyter Notebooks, and you get the notebook up there, and it's all ready to work. This is running against the back end of this um, GDS Docker container that I showed in one of the slides. It's all ready to go. All you have to do really is just download Docker, pull the container, Docker run container, and you're good to go. You should be presented with something like this when you connect your browser to, to the container. Uh, so, can I clear things up? The whole book, I mean, the whole content is there is not only the code, which is again something that sometimes you get books, and this is not criticism, it's just a different style that will have the book part as a book, and then the code part is a repo that you go afterwards. And if you want to recreate figure five in chapter three, then the code is somewhere else and you go and, and have it. That has actually benefits when the code changes, 
Uh, but our point with the book is that code is not an ancillary element. is is actually, as I said, a first class citizen, and and it's really hard to follow the concepts that we're trying to get to without reading code embedded in the in the narrative. So in our case, they're both they're both together. So when you load up the the notebook, you can run, and this is a warning. So I'm not too worried just yet. Uh, these are just warnings. Warnings are fine. Errors are not. Um, this is the so the actually let me. The chapter. This is the outline. Uh, we talk a little bit of an introduction of what I said, then we load up. We use an example with the San Diego uh, data set of Airbnb. And then we start with non spatial regression, so traditional regression without any space embedded in it. And we slowly start sort of building space into different ways. We talk about spatial heterogeneity and we talk about spatial dependence. So the idea that um, you may have observations related to each other because they're in the same place, which is heterogeneity. And you may also have rela uh, observations that are related to each other because they're close to each other rather than being in the same place. And the way you model those are actually rather rather different. And then we show you a couple of examples. And as I said, technically speaking, if you've done a little bit of econometrics, this is really not much more than OLS. There's a little bit more, but very little. The heavy lifting is, I think, on the conceptual side in trying to understand how you um, how you understand well, how you well, what parts of, of space you want to capture and you want to model and then how you translate that into a, an operational strategy that you can then write in code. Uh, I'm not going to do much more on these other than just because I can. Martin Fleischmann, who used to be with us at the lab, uh, was maintainer of GeoPandas, a big library, and he wrote while well, he was here actually, uh, this explore method, which takes a geodata frame and um, if you have created the data frame, it uh, it generates an, an interactive map. This is something that I know uh, Tmap has done for a long time. Okay. And just to show that that works just as expected, you get the uh, interactive map. You can move around, you can zoom in, you may even be able to, yes, get the tooltip on the data. And all of that works even on an iPad, which is streaming on Teams. Good enough. And so that's probably as much as I wanted to show on, on Python. And I do want to leave a few minutes for um, for questions or, or comments. Before that, I wanted to also show that the book is so cool and Python is so powerful, you can even run it from R um, if I'm allowed. So what are you going to see here? And hopefully not see the password um, is This is an R Studio instance also running out of a container. It has everything ready. Uh, if you come here to work, perhaps path, this is the book folder that I've shown you before. Instead of viewing it from Jupyter Lab, you're seeing it from R Studio, but it's exactly the same thing. It has a notebooks folder, so you can come here. And actually, um, what I haven't managed to do just yet is open up IPNB files from R Studio, uh, no criticism, but it is a bit of a criticism uh, that you can't because an open standard. But what you can do is take your IPNB file on uh, Jupyter Lab and say pair it with a Quarto file, and then if I get my way here, I should be getting a QMD file. When I refresh this, not just yet. And again, this did work this morning. So, no. 
I'm going to wait and pray. Maybe not. There is a second way that I could go. Uh, I would prefer not to. Uh, tension is building here. Okay. I'm going to give up and go for a second option, which you can actually do from uh, our studio if you're so inclined. So I'm going to go to work, Ratchpad, Bookmaster, Notebooks, and say Quarto, Convert this. Okay, so that gives me, I mean, what Jupyter Lab does behind the scenes is exactly this, but uh, when it does it, it's nicer through the interface. But now I should have a QMD file version of the chapter, which you can see here. Uh, I'm going to clear up things. Use the visual editor because that's how I roll. Okay, and then before that, I hope these also work. Articulate. So here I'm loading up the library that hooks up Python into an R session, and I'm telling it to use the environment that I'm using. And this, my friends, would make it work. So this is the same chapter, but rendered as a quarto document to be able to run it and it's looking good. Just the warnings. And I can read the file. And it's all there. I can explore it, although I don't think that's going to work. Yeah, it just prints that. And then finally, this is the let's see if that works. I can render the Quarto document and maybe we can start taking uh, questions because there's 53 code snippets and they need to complete before it renders the whole thing. Uh, but then maybe then we'll be able to see a render version of Quarto, of the Quarto version of the chapter. And with that, while it compiles gently, I'll take questions or comments if there's any.